from Babylon and Timbuktu, the black African Hebrews of Egypt and Ethiopia. From what period can we certify the existence of black Hebrews in Egypt and Ethiopia? It is certain that Israelites were in Egypt and Ethiopia during the period of King Takalot of Egypt, 23rd Tanite dynasty about 725 BC, and the prophet Isaiah of Jerusalem, because we read in Isaiah 11, 11 that, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros, Upper Egypt, and from Cush, Ethiopia. In Isaiah 27, 13, we get the understanding that the outcasts of Judah are in the land of Egypt. In 1918, the prophet is positive that five cities with Jews and Egyptian converts will accept the God of Israel and will speak the language of Canaan. Hebrew. About 70 years after Isaiah, the prophet Zephaniah in 310 says, From beyond the river of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. Many authorities have agreed that Zephaniah was speaking concerning the Jews who were dispersed and who colonized the region in and around Ethiopia. Since the Hebrew prophets and historians, for example, Josephus, knew that Jews were in Egypt and Ethiopia, the next question is, what are some of the theories concerning their arrival in these countries? The theories are as follows. King Solomon married the daughter of the king of Egypt. Obviously, this marriage was for economical and political reasons in 1 Kings 11.1. 1. Solomon wanted to maintain international peace, security, and commerce. It is probable that he arranged with Pharaoh, his father-in-law, to establish Jewish trade colonies on the Nile River. By the way, Solomon married the daughters of many kings to keep them under his economic and political control. In 1 Kings 9.26, we read that King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Jabur, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea and in the land of Edom. In Hiram, the king of Tyre and Orphanesia, sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold 420 talents and brought it to King Solomon. Many scholars have postulated that the land of Ophir is on the east coast of Africa. This would be an Ethiopian territory. It would appear highly probable that Solomon would establish trade colonies along the east and west coast of the Red Sea. Ancient Ethiopia had excessive gold deposits to satisfy Solomon's need. As has been mentioned previously, the Persian troops of Cambyses said, the prisoners in Ethiopia wore fetters of gold. The Queen of Sheba visited Solomon. The fact that her visit occurs after the voyage of Solomon Hiram's navy to Ophir suggests that, in the mind of the writer, Ophir was associated with the territory of that rich Queen of Sheba. Apparently, when the navy of Solomon came to Ophir, the Queen of Sheba heard about the greatness of Solomon. Josephus, the Jewish historian, certified the fact that the Queen of Sheba was the Queen of Egypt in Ethiopia. This would mean that Jewish trade colonies were established in her territory. Josephus also said that the royal city of the Ethiopians was Seba or Sheba. The two words are interchangeable. According to the Ethiopians and the black Jews of this country, the Queen of Sheba gave birth to a son of whom they say Solomon was his father. Moreover, they say that other black Jews accompanied the queen back to Ethiopia. The name of the child to whom he gave, she gave birth was Menelik. Years later, as the story is related, Menelik returned to Jerusalem for his education. On his return to Ethiopia, Solomon sent along with him some leading priests and officers. All these events occurred during the 10th century BC. This was probably the first organized Jewish colony in Ethiopia. In this same century, Shishak, the king of Egypt, invaded Palestine in 1 Kings 14.25. Without doubt, he must have transported many Jews to Egypt and Ethiopia because he took prisoners with him, and his army consisted of Libyans and Ethiopians. During the late part of the 8th or the early part of the 7th century, the Ethiopian general Taraka invaded Palestine and captured more than a few towns. The prophet Isaiah certainly knew that he was talking about when he spoke of the Israelites' exiles in Taraka's country at that time. Even the advance of the mighty Assyrian army would motivate many Israelites to take refuge in Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. 
Again, the incursions of the powerful army of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the years 698 to 675 into Palestine undoubtedly caused rapid and numerous migratory waves of Israelites to flee into North and East Africa. In Jeremiah 44, 1, the prophet addresses the Jews in Egypt and the Jews that live in Pathros, which is southern Egypt. Jeremiah tells the Jews in the 11th verse that they are not safe from Nebuchadnezzar. This warning would naturally influence many Jews to migrate deeper into Ethiopia and the Sahara Desert. By the time the prophet Zephaniah, about 630 BC, Ethiopia and the adjacent lands of Uganda and Kenya were swarming with black Jews. Zephaniah says in 310, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughters of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. This verse is an indication that the Israelites would be multiplying and making converts among the inhabitants beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. No doubt this prophet had communication with the Jews in this remote area. The rivers of Ethiopia connect with the Nile water system in the heart of Ethiopia. The Atbara River extends from the highlands of modern Ethiopia to the Nile. The Blue Nile extends from the direction of Addis Ababa in a northwestern direction toward the Nile. Near Uganda and the northern Congo is the Bar el Ghazal River. It is 500 miles long in the southwest Sudan. Formed by the confluence of the Bar el Arab and the Jewel Rivers in the northwest upper Nile, it flows east to unite at Lake No with the Bar el Jabal and to form the White Nile. These areas are beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Moreover, are there any records or oral traditions of the existence of Jewish tribes deeply beyond the rivers of Ethiopia? Joseph J. Williams cites a particular case. He said, there can be little doubt, but that somewhere in the dim past, probably by way of Abyssinia, a wave of Hebraic culture penetrated to the Lake District of East Africa. If we may credit the following citations, speaking of Uganda to the west of Lake Victoria and northeast of the Belgian Congo, it has an organized native government with a tradition of 33 kings and a legendary line that traces back to King David. It is a proud history. The legends tell of the Uganda people crossing the Nile, remember, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, centuries upon centuries ago, and subduing all tribes whose country they traversed. They claim the highest native civilization in Africa. The above report is highly credible in all its details, if we keep in mind what I have written pertaining to the Egyptian and Kushite Jews. The thing that might be questioned about the Ugandan people is not their identity, but the vitality of the Jewishness of their religion.